Welcome to the Business Behind Fundraising Podcast, where you'll discover how to raise the kind of money your big vision requires without adding more events, appeals, or grant applications. Learn how to stop blocking overall revenue growth and start attracting investment level donors with Sherry Quam Taylor. Hey guys, it's Sherry here. I have a really fun episode for you today. I was introduced to Arlene a few months ago and have been fangirling her ever since. So when I talk to other consultants, sometimes there's this moment where it's like, uh, oh, we run our businesses the same. And uh, I know there's a lot of us nonprofit consultants, but there was something about Arlene where we were back and forth like, me too, me too. Oh yeah, really, me too. Arlene has an amazing business working with people of color and women doing, uh, I'm going to say grant writing, but you're going to hear from her. It's so much more. Enjoy the podcast, reach out to her. Um, so many of you asked me for a, a grant writing referral and gosh, here it is right here served on a silver platter for you. So uh, enjoy the episode and let me know what you think. Hi, Arlene. Welcome to the podcast. Hello, and thank you for having me. <laughs> glad, glad you're uh, here. And I I, um, I love that I booked this uh, when our children have like one foot in a car going to college and all the things. And then we added this to our, our plate. So um, thank yeah. you. <laughs> thank you for doing that. Make it more interesting, why don't you? Yeah, just add it to the top. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so I've been excited to have you on. Um, you know, one of the reasons because I feel like we kind of are the same person when it comes to growing our businesses. And like immediately I felt like this, oh my gosh, um, I want to link arms with her and, and, and do this together. Um, so I just love for you to lay the groundwork. Um, tell us like how you've landed, where you are today. Uh, and that'll set us up for the rest of our conversation. Sure. Well, I had no intention of working as a grant writer, owning a business, or working in the nonprofit space, but here I am. <laughs> That's um, where our story starts similar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So my background is actually biomedical sciences. So um, I started off my career uh, working for a research institution. Um, and in that process, had some wonderful, wonderful bosses that really encouraged me to go back to school after my undergrad and, and go and pursue my PhD. So uh, we were also working with a woman um, from uh, the Health Science Center. I'm located in, in San Antonio. And she ended up would end up being my mentor for my PhD. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was a, a natural transition. We had a project that was ongoing. So um, my focus was research and that, you know, was what I wanted to do. So uh, in that capacity, um, you know, had peer reviewed um, articles that I was putting out, posters, um, I have 10 U.S. patents, so wow. full-fledged scientists with a lab coat and um, Love it. and all that kind of stuff. And, and then after I finished my Ph.D., I went to um, uh, get um, a position um, with the Army at, in a research institution. And so I did that for a couple of years, and then I became a program coordinator for one of the research departments there. Um, but it really just wasn't an environment that was very conducive to ha- being a young mom, which I was at the mm-hmm. time. I gave birth to both of my babies while I would get, was pursuing my PhD. Oh my gosh. Um, my second baby, I defended three days before I gave birth to him. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. So I I like to file things on. Um, So anyway, um, and I I knew that I needed to transition my skill sets. There weren't a lot of opportunities for research here in San Antonio. Um, And so I went through a company that helped me with my resume, helped me with interviewing. But one of the things that they did was um, a skill assessment. And so when I took that skill assessment, one of the things that came to the the top was grant writing. And I didn't know who did this. So that was my first question. Who does this and who do you do this for? And so, you know, they said um, institutions of higher education, which I just came from. I wasn't didn't want to go back to that, Um, you know, government. uh, I was just working for the government. So I didn't want to go back to that. And then they said nonprofits. And I said, okay, that's where I think I might want to try it. Um, so I went with, uh, on my first interview, landed the job and, um, it was the best experience for me. So I worked for that nonprofit for four and a half years. Um, and, uh, I wasn't sure if my skill sets were going to tra- transfer. I did really well in the science, uh, area, yeah. raised about $189 million for various Holy uh, research 
research projects, including um, I secured a grant for my PhD, which paid uh, my stipend, and it also paid my uh, mentor to have me in her lab, you know, with with supplies and things like that. And then I also secured a grant for my postdoc position mm-hmm. when I was with the army. So, um, so I wasn't sure if it was going to transfer. I knew I was good in the science area, but yeah. I didn't know if it was going to apply to nonprofits. Turns out it did. So for that organization that I worked for for four and a half years, raised thirty five million dollars. Um, so I transferred. Really married, apparently, <laughs> it transferred. Yeah. <laughs> It transferred, it transferred pretty well. Oh my um, God. And that organization was just, it was uh, just wonderful and uh, multi state. So, everywhere from Texas over to Florida um, and very collaborative. So, we were constantly working with other nonprofits in these other yeah. cities. And it really gave me a lot of exposure to what the philanthropic space was like in those states. Um, And when you overlay that area with, you know, what is referred to as the opportunity index, how well a person does in life is determined by their zip code. Well, the other thing is that's for the individual, but I was Mm -hmm. also seeing that for a lot of the nonprofits that we were working with and collaborating with. And so if they were led by women of uh, people of color or women, um, they tended to not do as well in terms of fundraising. Mm -hmm. Um, And that just really was curious to me. And it was um, what really planted the seed that I wanted to go out on my own um, and do the work that I'm doing for other organizations um, led by women and led by people of color um, and just make more of an impact. And so that's really why I started my business, um, Ascend Nonprofit and Business Solutions. Uh, You know, I love that moment. Uh, Again, I just said, I just said, when we talk, there's all these things like, oh, me too, me too. Um, I did have that moment also when I left my corporate career that I loved and I thought, how, wait, hold on, wait, how did I get over here in nonprofit? Um, but I will tell you when I joined this nonprofit that was near dear to me, near and dear to me, and we started scaling the revenue quickly, there were these like aha moments of, oh, I've done this before. It might be a little bit different, but you know, kind of you're talking about, you're talking about like, was that a transferable skill? Um, it it was, you know, I had that feeling too and thought I can, I loved that part of it where I, it, you know, built confidence in me, but I also feel like Arlene, I don't know if you felt like this. I also feel like the objectivity of not having grown up, if you will, in the nonprofit space was, um, was like, like, like a big benefit to me. Cause I didn't have all those misconceptions. I was like, wait, why would we do it that way? Like, why, why wouldn't we spend money on this? Um, you know, and so I just, I just felt like that was the biggest uh, freedom for me to think big and to think abundant and uh, really launch strongly into my business and, and like just be really confident of doing things differently. Uh, I don't know if you had the same feeling of, of uh, when you entered the nonprofit space. I did. Absolutely. I felt that um, I I took pride in in the fact that I was an outsider (laughs) Um, and that I had a different perspective. And so I think it also, you know, was a lot of why are we doing it this way? This is not how the the for profit area does this. And um, why do you think you have to continue to do it that way? And so. Uh, you know, even in working for that nonprofit, they were very much innovative and um, very out of the box thinkers because they were working with small businesses. Um, you know, that's their mission is uh, providing access to capital and business education. So you're working with a group that needs to be innovative, that needs to be, you know, forward thinking, that needs to be strategic. And so the organization itself was, and so that really gave me, a, they gave me a lot of space to think outside the box. So that was good for me in that nonprofit sector. So when I, you know, am working with clients now through my business, um, that is one of the things that I'm constantly work, helping them with is tearing down those preconceived barriers and maybe yes. those ones that also just have existed institutionally within the philanthropic space of you don't have to do it this way right. and um, you can think outside the box you can be innovative um, and so you know I, I do think that coming from an outside perspective has very much benefited me in my business and um, my clients in terms of the work that we provide so good okay so your phone rings and 
uh, it's somebody calling you to say like, wait, can, can Arlene help me? Um, I always ask like, like, what are you listening for on that first call? Like, how do you know immediately that, that you're like, I can help this person? Uh, who's, you know, who's your ideal client really? Our ideal client is really someone who is um, the leadership is innovative and strategic. Mm-hmm. Um, so what I'm listening for is desperation. Um, do they have that? And where is it coming from? Have they considered some solutions to help them out of the current perspective they're in? Are they reactive versus proactive? Mm-hmm. Um, how do they describe the space of grant writing, which is the space that we are in? So we, we only do, um, you know, research and uh, writing services. Yeah. So we don't do, um, you know, any events and things like that or, or individual giving. We stick within that grant um, space. So when we're talking about their, um, their revenue that they're generating from grants, Um, You know, when was the last time they did their strategic plan? Are they sticking to it? Do they have a plan for fundraising as well outside of the organization's strategic plan? Um, Do they have a good concept of how the grant process works? Are they putting all of the responsibility or have they historically put that all on the grant writer? Because um, I constantly teach that fundraising is a team sport. It is it is not all on the grant writer. Um, And so those are the things that I'm listening for is, and then, you know, in terms of the problems that they're having, I'm listening for those pain points and have they considered other solutions? And are they looking for, um, you know, organizations like myself um, for that solution? Or is it just kind of like, I just need you to do this and get it done for me? Yeah. Um, because that's not an ideal client. Um, that's not someone that we're really going to, you know, if, if that's someone that I feel we're going to have to constantly pull things yep. out of and they haven't thought big, yeah. um, you know, and then we look at their 990s and we kind of assess how they have been doing. Is there an increase in revenue? Is it a decrease? I'll ask them about that and why that is. Um, if they're new to the organization, why were they drawn to it? That's mm-hmm. a big thing for me. If I get a sense that it's just for a paycheck, that's probably not right. the best person for us to work with. Yeah. Um, you know, what, what drew them to that organization? And then if they came from some other place, why did they leave and what were the issues? Mm-hmm. Um, because we take that into the next position if we haven't unpacked all of that. So I need to know what I'm working with. Um, so those are the things that, you know, we that I'm looking for from a um, character leadership perspective. Yeah. And then, you know, we, we assess the numbers in and of itself. Sure. So we have a questionnaire that is uh, a survey that is on our website that they have to answer for us to have those conversations. And that mo- mainly is around, you know, just the grant space um, yeah. and, and how they have been doing historically. When leaders reach out to you, are they sometimes in the position of trying to figure out like, okay, do we outsource this to an expert like yourself? Should we do it in house? Um, Sometimes I don't really find a a kind of rhyme and reason as to why some of my clients might have an in-house grant writer. Some of them are have wonderful partnerships, you know, with with someone like yourself. Um, Do you find that they're wrestling with that or like, do you help them through that? Or what's your thought on that? Yeah, so we have a lot of conversations with people who are just like, we've never considered it before. We've always had an in-house grant writer, but we're starting to, you know, think about what that might look like. Um, and I love those conversations. Um, I love to inform people, even if they don't end up using our services, I just want them to know what it's like versus their preconceived ideas yes. or any experience that they have had in the past with a single consultant whether it be a grant writer or somebody in marketing or communications, whatever that experience is, is, is for them, they're bringing it into um, what they think you're going to do. Um, and I'm not everybody else. Um, you know, that my business is different from everybody. So I want them to have my information um, to be able to take that knowledge, process that for themselves, their organization, and figure out if it's a good fit. Yeah. So I love educating um, leaders who are just testing the waters to see what that would look like for them. Uh, I think it's important for them to have as much information as they make those decisions mm-hmm. as possible. And do you feel like 
um, maybe that has changed since 2020 or, you know, just in these post 2020 years, um, you know, maybe I'll just ask twofold, like, has that conversation changed? And then what has changed for your business? Is it, uh, you know, mine has grown tremendously, which I would have, I would say like March of 2020, when everything went on pause, I, I wouldn't have believed how busy I would even be today in, in 2023 um, and how much my business grew because, I think it brought to the surface a lot of organizations who who leaned heavy into that time. And I loved that. And the, the abundant minded leaders came to the top. Um, I'd just be curious to know how, uh, you know, just how your business has grown and maybe what you're seeing here these last few years. After 2020, it was definitely a big change. So my conversations frequently with leaders who were inquiring about our services prior to that was always me having to really explain what virtual looked like. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, check, check, just, that's done. Yeah, they just couldn't wrap their heads around, you mean you're never going to be in the office? You mean I can't <laughs> just walk down to your cubicle and, you know, tell you what I need? It, they they really, really struggled with what a virtual grant yeah. writer meant. They and, were cute back then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And now we don't have to have that conversation anymore at all. Um, yes. Now it really is about the process. It really is about communication. It's about um, how we work. So the virtual component, I, I rarely ever have to have yeah. that anymore. And, um, you know, definitely there was a lot of during that time where um, people were trying to hire grant writers in house. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, people weren't interested. So I would have people reach out to me on LinkedIn or mm -hmm. whatever else and say, we think you'd be perfect for this role and we'd like to hire you as an employee. And I'm like, no, I don't want to be an employee. I will be a contractor. Well, that's not what we're interested in right now. Okay. So they go away for a certain period of time <laughs> and then they come back and say, we'd like to revisit this yeah, because yeah. they had trouble hiring. Um, and so uh, those conversations were, were great for me as well, because um, the majority of them did come back and ended up being clients during that yeah. time who were initially trying to hire me. So I, I think the landscape definitely has changed from that perspective. Um, now it's just more questions around processes, around strategy and what that looks like for their organization and how we fit into that. Yeah. Yeah. And how have you seen, you know, all the buzz right now is like, well, now our COVID funding is ending. And so now how do we replace those dollars this year? And um, are, are people coming to you, or maybe now especially saying, okay, well, hold on. Uh, we, we had those extra dollars these last couple of years. And now uh, where are those dollars? And we need to get real about it. Are you, are you having those conversations? Um, a few of them, not mm -hmm. too much. I feel like um, the clients that we currently work with um, have been thinking about that and they Good. knew it wasn't going to be long term. So they've been planning for it and we've been having those conversations. But um, I mean, we, we kind of had them all along anyway, mm -hmm. was we're, we're always talking about diversifying their revenue. Yes. Um, just because I'm in the grant space, I do not believe that, you know, every any organization's um, revenue should solely come from grant writing. So there is diversified revenue overall, and then even just diversified within the grant space. So um, I'm constantly encouraging them to try new funders. Um, you know, Good. I do find that a lot of nonprofits um, tend to be a little um, fearful over national organizations, national funding organizations. Um, and that is one of the things that I try and help them shift their mindset about. Um, and then the other space is really collaboration and looking at it very differently, because that is one of the big differences that I have also seen since 2020 is, you know, funders aren't interested in siloed approaches to yes. um, community problems. So many of our nonprofits really don't know how to collaborate successfully. They've, they've been with this mindset of um, scarcity and fear around funding, and we're all in competition with one yeah. another. So I've really been working hard to change that and to help create collaborations around larger sources of funding. And that's one of the things that I work on with my clients. Um, and if in the, in the process of um, looking at a potential new client, I also am looking for that. Like, what is their, what is their feelings around collaboration? Mm -hmm. Are they open to that? Because 
Um, in order to really grow your organization, you've got to look at it from that perspective. And it's not just with nonprofits. Um, you know, it's in the, the church and ministry space. It's in the for-profit space. Yeah. There are a lot of opportunities um, for bids and contracts that for-profits go after where they could partner with nonprofits. Yes. And that's not a space that a lot of nonprofits know how to navigate. So yeah. that is another place that we educate on. Um, and then just assess how open they are to that um, as we're onboarding. Mm. You know, I want to go back to the comment you made about the national funding. You know, a number of my clients who were very regional or city specific and then virtual. And they said, oh, I wonder, I wonder if this would work in other cities since we're at our, at our computers. Um, a number of my clients have jumped into that national growth game, if I can call it that. Um, and maybe they were in one city in COVID and now they're in eight or now they're in 10. Um, what would your advice be for organizations who maybe were very funding, uh, regionally funding uh, their organizations and, and are saying, wait, is there national funding? Like what, what would your advice be to groups who are thinking about that? I normally recommend that we start doing partnerships and conversations mm -hmm. with other organizations that serve a similar population in those cities, making introductions, yeah. um, you know, if possible, even going out there to go and visit and just starting that process and that conversation of what that would look like to ease their, them, their organization into that new region. Yeah. Um, so that, and because we work on a national level, if we have a client that is in that particular area will connect them um, with that organization and um, you know just talk to them about what that space is and what those key connections need to be for those for, for that maybe that first year of trying to move into that new space. Arlene you're doing amazing client work. I know you told me some of your stories last time we talked so I hope you're going to weave, weave some of that in here in the last half here but um, talk to me a little bit about how you work. So you're you're serving clients with direct service, but also um, I want you to talk about these uh, courses you've created and uh, you know what inspired you to create them, and um, just talking through you know that focus on the research, the writing, the readiness. Um, talk to me about that balance that you're that you're um, you've created in your business. As our business started to grow and we, um, you know, really started to get a lot more people interested in our services. When I was having those conversations, I recognized that there was a certain population of, of um, new nonprofits or nonprofits that had just kind of gotten started, but were coasting along because yeah. there wasn't a full-time person there. Um, it was kind of a side gig, not necessarily a full, yeah. now they wanted to make it a full, uh, full-blown nonprofit, a grown-up nonprofit. Um, there were some people that we could not help with our services. They just weren't in a position to, to um, afford sure. us and to be able to work with us. But I still wanted to meet their needs. And so that's when I decided that um, I thought courses were a good mm -hmm. opportunity for that. And so we, we created um, our courses with them in mind. So thinking really about that grassroots um, nonprofit leader who's doing it all. Yeah. Um, and what could they benefit from and what, you know, to me, education is key, period. And so what could they benefit from, from an education standpoint that would really help them in their or in their organization and, and um, allow it to grow? So we first started with a grant writing course mm -hmm. and um, and that is, um, you know, an eight week course. They're writing an actual grant during that time. The videos are based on that. It's on demand. Cool. Uh, so they can access it 24 seven according to what they need. But as we were doing that class, I also started to recognize they didn't have a good understanding of budgets. Mm -hmm. um, many of them were not grant ready. So yeah. even the course itself was a little uh, premature for them. Yeah. So I started to create some other courses around what I was seeing with the groups that I was working with. So for the first course that we put out with the grant writing, we um, have served about a, a little under 200 um, nonprofit leaders and um, all over the country. Great. But I saw that within that population, many of them weren't ready. And so then that led us to our grant readiness course. And then I saw, you know, a, a vast majority of them did not understand how to set up an organization budget, a project budget, things like that. So we created another course based on that. 
And then the feedback that I got in surveys was this course is great on grant writing, but where do we find grants? Mm -hmm. So then that led to a research class. (laughs) So um, re- research, ding, ding, ding. Yeah. So <laughs> everything has really been based on the feedback that I get from them um, and just trying to meet the needs. And we do have a certain number that will take the course and then become our clients once they reach a certain revenue. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they take it enough, they take it and they learn enough to know they don't want to do it yeah. <laughs> from themselves. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and so they'll, they'll make enough, you know, um, with, uh, writing the grants themselves and generating that revenue. And it's with the goal of being able to hire us to yeah. come on. So the business feeds itself all the way around because the other thing too, is that for some of our clients who do want to have someone in house as well, um, they can send their employees through training yeah. with us. And so they'll take the, our courses for training as well. Yeah, that's great. You know, I always feel, um, so just like in what I do, it's like there's nine million of me, I guess, or, or perceived that there's nine. I think I'm, I think I'm unique, but you know, it's like oh, it's a fundraising consultant or it's a grant writer, if you will. Uh, and I'm like, we're more than that. Um, I, I guess I'll ask you, like, how do you set yourself apart? Like, and maybe it's it's your the the approach you're taking, that that research, that technical eye that you have. Um, you know, I would say like, what is the unique a thing that you do that's really you know made your business grow and made, and made you specifically just effective in this space. Well, I think one of the things is what we touched on at the beginning, which is I didn't come from this sector. I mm-hmm. you know I, I, it wasn't my intention, so I have that outsider's perspective. Yeah. I um, see that a nonprofit is a business. It's just a different IRS classification. So in terms of building your business, I feel like we have a lot of similarities there yeah. that I can draw from the aspect of growing my business, the same as growing that nonprofit business and helping that leader be able to do that. So I bring that perspective in. We do a lot of professional development Mm -hmm. in the space of, you know, everything grant writing, but also just professional development to grow my business. And so I'm able to help leaders and say, hey, have you read this book or you should take this class or this is a great coach for you. Um, So I'm, I'm able to give them that perspective. And because we write on a national level, it really does give you a very different perspective than if you're just a regional writer or we're also general grant writers. So we don't write for a specific niche like the arts or just education. We write for all. So I really train my grant writers as well to be able to bring in those other perspectives. So when we're writing something for health and human services, there could be something from workforce development that really would strengthen this organization in terms of if they incorporated that or had that partner. Um, But also just maybe there's processes. I mean, even for my own company, as I developed processes and workflow through my company, um, I did that with somebody who came from the grocery business. Oh, love that. <laughs> Logistics were, and know, process. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and their background was military background. Um, and so in terms of um, you know, taking skill sets from a whole other area and bringing yeah. that into a space, you wouldn't think that, you know, grocery chain type of workflow and how products get distributed to all those stores would apply to grant writing, but right. there is an aspect that does. Yeah, um, and so working with someone to help me do that was really big. Um, and so I'm teaching our nonprofit leaders to think in that space as well. And don't be closed minded and, um, to, to the ideas that other sectors have yes. and don't stay within this, with the same group all the time. You've got to get out from the nonprofit space. And so, um, so chambers of commerce and things like that are really important for you to be able to expose yourself to other individuals who are working in those other spaces that could help you. So I think that is, you know, mm-hmm. something else that we bring to the table that makes yeah. it different. Um, and then for, you know, leaders of color, um, also, you know, being a person of color, I think also helps us, um, you know, being in a space with another woman leader. Yep. Um, there are things that we've all experienced in our, you know, uh, professional environment that 
we can sit there and say, I understand. Yes. I, I really can empathize with you on this because I've been there too. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a combination of all of those things. And then our, um, the way that we work is, is I think very different. So it's very strategic. It's very structured. It's got a process. It's got a workflow. I find that so many of the nonprofits that we onboard are just amazed that the grant space could be so structured. I love that. You're speaking my language here. Yeah. And that, you know, you don't have to take two months to write a grant, a Mm -hmm. great grant application that gets funded. Um, And that when you put these systems and processes in place, they make you more efficient. Um, They increase your revenue. They trickle to other areas of the business. Um, And that's not something that this sector, I feel, has really been trained to do, um, is to really look at that, the business aspects of it. Um, And so I think that, you know, is is another uh, big difference. And then in terms of the the business itself, um, you know, we we hire, we have a contract grant writing model, and and that's by design, and it really works for a certain uh, type of person who's really looking for that flexibility in their lives to be able to do some work, raise their family, take care of people in their family, deal with their own health issues, um, and then contribute to the overall community. And um, and so I, I think all those combinations are what makes us different. Yeah, I would agree. I feel like when I started, so I'm on year, I think I'm on year 11 of my business. If I, if I, I think, um, I say that cause like, I think when I was year nine, I said I was 10 and then I got confused, but I think it's 11. <laughs> but when I started investing in myself as a leader, when I started hiring coaches, when I started saying, um, okay, what's next, what's the next level, what's the next level. It was amazing to me how that translated directly to my clients. Um, and, and I'm such a believer in it, in investing in myself as a leader. Um, and I'll say that even when I'm on a first call and I say, I, w- I want to work with people who say I'm ready to invest in myself. Um, you're going to be an A plus student. Like I want to be an A plus student with my coaches. And uh, a lot of times that is the the business behind fundraising uh, that we're working on or the mindset or um, so many of the things that we've worked on as, as women leading businesses mm-hmm. um, that frankly, I feel like has made even a bigger impact, um, you know, on my life and my family and, and all of that. So um, I think that's why we we connect because um, it's always what's next and how can I be better and then how can I turn around and pour that into my clients? Mm-hmm. I think when we're coached and we're coachable, um, we end up doing that for our clients. So I, I had a, a client, um, we worked with them for about two and a half years and then uh, she decided that she wanted someone in house. That person stayed with her for maybe about seven months. Um, and then she came back. And But I had to have a, a very frank conversation with her because when we did work with her, everything was reactive. Mm-hmm. Um, she was always behind. We were getting things at the last minute. The submissions were at the last minute. Everything just felt rushed and extremely yeah. stressful. And so I had to have a really frank conversation with her. And it was a coachable moment to say, we love your mission. We love your organization. You as an individual are wonderful, yeah. but in terms of your leadership, you are always behind. It's always rushed. And we don't feel like we're putting out the best product for you. Yes, we've raised money for you, but we feel like we could do more yeah. if you could get this together. So, you know, and if we're going to take you on again, these are some of the things that need to change. And, um, you know, she was open to that. She said, help me. I don't, I don't know, obviously, or I'd be doing better. And, um, you know, and so we were able to work with her and now we have this, you know, seamless, uh, process in place between our organization and hers. We've been able to write more grant applications as a result of that. And therefore her revenue has drastically increased because of that, just making, you know, putting some things in place and her agreeing to, you know, letting me come in and, you know, clean up their files and, you know, uh, let her know what documents were really outdated and we need to put this in place. And then working with her on what a real strategy looks like and having her stick to that because everything was a yes all the time. Even if Mm -hmm. like, you know, a board member would send her a grant and say, I think we need to apply. I didn't feel like it was a good one for her. And she'd be like, let's just apply. And I'm like, we're not utilizing, 
you know, your time and resources in a good way by just taking on everything. Um, you know, part of it was she wanted to use me as that shield too with her, yeah. with her board. So I said, I'm fine to come yeah. in and come and talk to them. And this is the way we're going to do this. And this is more efficient and this works better yeah. for the organization. So when we did those things, you know, we, we helped to make her better as a leader. And then it, you know, it trickled over to the whole organization. Yeah. You had to be honest with her, which I think sometimes it's like hard to do, but um, that's making her money that that you are really a colleague to colleague, like something Mm -hmm. has to change here. So good. Yeah. We have to not be fearful to have those conversations. Yeah. Cause, cause I, I need someone to say that to me too. Exactly. I I want someone to say, Arlene, this isn't working. You know, we need to change this. Yeah. Okay. Um, one more success story, Arlene, and then I want you to tell us. How do people find you? I hope I hope everybody listens to this and comes and talks to you because I enjoy every conversation. Um, but give me one more, one more like, oh my gosh, this is my my go to story. In terms of you know a, a success story, we started working with um, a an agency that does workforce development, and when they when they brought us on, they had been at about the two million dollar mark for. Mm, I'd say about three years, they were really having trouble getting over that. And so they were looking for someone to help them, but they didn't know how to do it, obviously, or they would have done it themselves. So as they were interviewing a bunch of uh, grant writers, what they said stood out to us, and they have been a client now for four years, um, what they said stood out was the fact that we were really asking strategic questions. Mm -hmm. And they knew from that conversation themselves that that we would be that organization to help them. So when they came on board, you know, we, we we put a lot of things in place, we have something called like a plan on a page and a data dashboard, that just takes all of the information that's in our digital files everywhere, consolidates them in into, um, you know, this big Excel spreadsheet. And then they were able to see their whole organization on oh my paper. Gosh. And that was a game really, changer. Yeah, that was a game changer for them. No, nobody had ever done that. And it was mm. an, an organization that's existed for um, 12 years. So they were able to see the really big picture and then could identify where those gaps were and and what they needed in order to move things forward. Then we took a look at like, what is their process? And we identified two people in the organization who were their major bottlenecks to moving things forward. Not because they weren't great employees, not because they weren't trying. They put so much on their plates that they were always three or four days behind emails, behind producing some contract, behind, you know, data for a grant, whatever that may yep. be. And we took a look at what what were they really doing compared to what their job description was. Mm. And then we said, okay, we need to segment this. And there's certain things that we need to take off of these people's plate, give it to somebody else, free them up to focus on their thing. When they did that, um, you know, their revenue went from that little under two million um, to five million oh that gosh. first year, and then now we've gotten them to eight million. Wow! Um, and so it's those strategies that, when you invest that time, it is a little bit of time up front. Yeah, so worth it. And now they've grown from about eight people to twenty-two, and oh very gosh. strategic on who they're hiring and for what. Everyone is not jack of all trades within the organization doing all the stuff. Everyone has a role and it's working out so much better for them. Congratulations. Um, and the you know board members that they're bringing on are a higher caliber with yes. better connections, um, connections that really serve them, not just in terms of you know just funding, but connections to city council, connections to the county, connections to um, institutions of higher education and helping them to form those partnerships because they're in the workforce development sector. So, you know, that has really, really been key for them. I love it. And it's, it's, it's back to the like, so simple concept of like, are our our hours aligned with dollars? You know, or are we three days late on an email because we're, we're, in the spin cycle. There's yeah, some, there's some practicality tasks. to that, you yeah. know? We're doing tasks that don't equate to that dollar. And, yeah. and, you know, yes, they need to get done, but not necessarily by certain people. Yes. So good. Okay, Arlene, how can people find you? Give us all the stats. Links, sure. Everything. So you can find us at www.ascendnbs.com. 
Um, we're also on LinkedIn. We are on uh, social media, Facebook, Instagram under ascend at NBS nbs.com and um, you can also find me on LinkedIn Arlene Siller. Awesome. Thank you Arlene for the conversation. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Business Behind Fundraising podcast. Tune in weekly and you'll get seriously good at fully funding your organization's big vision year after year. Yes, even your overhead. Visit www.quamtaylor.com. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review on Apple Podcasts.